professor in head gi and hpv surgery and liver transplant at aims rishikesh uh, previously sir has held very key posts as a consultant uh, and also presently as consultant professor in head department of G gi and hepatobiliary surgery amrita institute of medical sciences and research center kochi uh, the senior clinical fellowship in transplant surgery aden brooks hospital cambridge university hospitals and consulted locum in uh, transplant surgery aden brooks hospital cambridge university hospitals so uh, has numerous awards to his credit uh, such as the best speaker award at annual conference of indian association of surgical gastroenterology at calcutta asicon uh, and the fourth international endoscopy surgery award from evaluation committee of endoscopies awards 2007 in china and the professor Ra raghav cherry oration for 2018 at kerala asi annual conference in kochi the dr ramesh nigam memorial award 2015 delivered at the 75th annual conference of the asi in gurgaon 2015 sir is on the editorial boards of several important journals such as hepatogastroenterology uh, and is the national editor for india world journal of surgical oncology so it has many many publications to his to his credit and has contributed immensely to the writing of numerous books i welcome you sir good evening friends greetings from aims rishikesh uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of these uh, multi pronged approaches which is what the need of our for most of these kind of uh, diseases is uh, and i really really appreciate uh, the uh, joint efforts from both sides uh, in this uh, all the efforts done in this regard um my remit today is a broader canvas uh, for this i need to move the microscope away from nafeld and look at the big bigger picture so so i'm just borrowing the slide uh, from a, a previous speaker uh, our director had put this up so we're just looking at the nafeld bit but actually the whole patient is composed of the entire the bigger picture and he's bigger as well to put it politically inappropriately Uh, so uh, we've always referred to it as obesity. So I think the two things I wanted to stress was uh, it's not just the obesity bit, but the you know the conceptual change in our understanding of this as as adiposity-based chronic disease, hence the ABCD. Uh, obesity is of course a huge problem worldwide. Uh, it was called the new pandemic, but I think it's been edged out by more recent uh, phenomena. Uh, a WHO fact sheet actually shows it tripled in the four decades from seventy six to Uh, to uh, five decades till 2016 uh, and currently it's believed that more than 2 billion adults uh, are overweight and a staggering 650 million of them are actually um, uh, obese which is a 13% and similar figures for children both under 5 and uh, you know the adolescent uh, post 5 uh, years old also so i think the point i want to make is the uh, whether it's obesity or adiposity it's still in evolution and i think it's gradually moving towards the concept of adiposity so it is a you know this has been the traditional body mass index kind of classification for uh, nutrition if you like both for malnutrition on both uh, ends of the extreme where the overweight is between 25 and 30 and obese is above 30 uh, super obese above 35 uh, but you know if you actually look at this uh, comparison where both with the same height same weight a little difference in shape would have the same bmi so obviously bmi is not everything so you can have it's what is important is the body fat percentage and uh, clearly uh, the less the body fat the more the number of uh, uh, you know packs you have whether up to 10 packs or whatever you like or a, or a family pack so there are inherent flaws with this bmi centric definition and uh, hence the management strategy we need to apply Uh, so it presumes the excess weight is only due to fat mass in for instance liver disease it could be uh, the uh, you know the situs it could be muscle mass in a bodybuilder it could be edema in other uh, organ failures like cardiac and renal uh, also you know like for instance in asia pacific it's believed that we have more of visceral adiposity so lower cutoffs have been uh, uh, could be def uh, defined uh, and they might you know clash with this just a bmi centric definition there's also a confounding association of mild obesity with decreased risk for certain uh, chronic diseases which is called the ob obesity paradox it also does not account for actually the complications which are more important you know you might have uh, nafeld which is associated with uh, certain types of uh, uh, adiposity like central or visceral rather than the 
uh, seen in ladies uh, in the subcutaneous depots. Uh, it is insufficiently accounts for the metabolically healthy obese. Uh, and it's not part of any of the traditional scores that we have for cardiovascular disease. Clearly, uh, ABCD is associated with a higher cardiovascular risk uh, uh, score. Uh, and also, you can undertreat higher risk people and overtreat low risk people. So, with the, because of that, I think the now many people are uh, accepting this ABCD as more important than uh, obesity alone as a as a pure marker. This is of course an important part of it, and you can see the number of articles skyrocketing till uh, COVID pushed it downwards. Uh, so, it's potential politically also more correct. It causes less stigmatization and potentially could make the management of this patient easier. So it's a paradigm shift in not just nomenclature, but also acceptance of a lot of these confounding factors. Uh, it accepts the, you know, the degree and distribution of the fat. So, you know, we might start looking at imaging techniques, which are uh, contributing. So uh, as Dr. Vartika said in the uh, afternoon that, uh, you know, we, we have other methods of looking at the total volume of fat. We might need to look at the, where this fat is distributed has clearly shown that some of the visceral bits are much more important. You know, the, the apple was the pear. Uh, it also confirms that associated syndromes along with the chronic diseases are a combined health, uh, health risk. It's a complications based approach rather than obesity or fat based approach, you know, uh, stigmatizing the, uh, the poor patient. It also suggests the pathophysiology to, to include endocrine and immune responses. So we automatically start looking at uh, treatment modalities also there, apart from just the physical fat mass and uh, looking only at uh, reducing the uh, diet or exercise alone. Of course, there are important parts as well. Uh, it al also probably offers basis for preventive aspects, especially in the young as outlined by my previous uh, speaker. So that's why many of the societies worldwide have accepted this. They are deposited based uh, uh, chronic uh, disease as a uh, new diagnostic term on both sides of the Atlantic uh, and they accept it and have made uh, positions, uh, position statements on this. And it's also helped us to contextualize the factors which are important. Uh, we, you know, as uh, doctors tend to stress only on the medical or the visibly clinical factors, but there could be social science uh, things. And I'm so happy you've involved the, uh, you know, the the community medicine people and the family medicine, because uh, quite a few of these are actually social science approaches. I was part of an international uh, consortium for antibiotic, uh, you know, stewardship for looking at how we can reduce uh, uh, antibiotic uh, uh, abuse and uh, uh, resistance. And we found some of the most powerful tools were actually sociological, anthropological, looking at who's prescribing those antibiotics. So we need to look at similar uh, you know, features here and only then we can tackle them. And it's been also shown by my uh, previous speaker. So, uh, so uh, you know, Ajit and Dr. Sarin have shown uh, earlier that we have genetic uh, reasons for NAFLD, but it also translates into the various other complications which are associated in these uh, ABCD patients. The metabolic uh, syndrome and each of its components, uh, all the cardiovascular disease and stroke as well, uh, NAFL, NASH complex, gallbladder disease, uh, lung disease, including uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, a lot of cancers are predisposed actually, and uh, you know, uh, tackling the uh, excess uh, adiposity can actually reduce the risk of those. Uh, the various inflammatory conditions, including degenerative uh, uh, joint disease uh, and other uh, things apart from the social stigma alone. There's a real threat of death. It's associated with the five of the leading causes of death and disability. And death rate doubles uh, depending on the, you know, the as as the uh, we go up the spectrum. Sudden explained death is much commoner, and as we've seen in COVID nineteen, each of these factors, whether it's the increased thromboembolic risk or the the lung factors, have had multiple challenges. The diabetes, uh, the nephrid in them have had multiple challenges and has been, you know, a, a, a huge killer in these patients. So I think it's time to save the veil and see the bigger picture. If you, you know, pardon the politically inappropriate pun. Um, so the most important, of course, is a metabolic syndrome, and I think you're all aware of uh, the uh, cluster that it has. Uh, and additionally, it can cause uh, more cardiovascular disease and stroke and diabetes. Uh, and it, uh, you know, uh, involves uh, some of these uh, uh, increased waist circumference, increased sugar, pressure, uh, triglycerides, or a reduction in uh, the good cholesterol. So pathophysiology, um, you know, not really known, but there is some form of hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance and a variety of inflammatory mediators, which can also, uh, you know, be altered, which can result in this. And uh, what is important is, as uh, was alluded earlier, 
uh, that we can actually tackle each of these uh, at uh, you know uh, with the various therapies including cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, you know the improving sleep uh, uh, all those things can actually be addressed if we look at it uh, including nafeld and uh, nash so surgery uh, you know the the important thing is surgery is an important part of the whole perspective all patients who are super obese probably need surgery uh, or if they are you know less degrees but with severe comorbidity or metabolic indications which are not responding to medical management uh, these would need surgery as well uh, liver transplantation is also a surgery which is done in uh, uh, complicated uh, uh, end stage uh, liver disease uh, or uh, high meld cirrhotics in when in nafeld or nash uh, in addition non bariatric procedures non um, uh, you know bariatric metabolic surgical procedures can also be required both for metabolic syndrome as well as for malignancy so there is a perspective of the surgeon also to be involved we tend to you know include only the medical specialties when we make consensus statements so i think it's important to add the uh, surgeons also uh, within that purview so uh, these surgeries tend to be you know either restrictive malabsorptive resectional uh, for the you know the ones which cause uh, uh, weight loss or uh, basically most of them tend to be a variety of these uh, there are some non bariatric metabolic surgeries which are exciting and coming up and uh, uh, i'm not going to you know uh, detail much on the technical aspects of surgery but just uh, familiarize you with some of them so that you know you are aware the jejunal ileal bypass was the first one done it's mostly historical because so much of uh, side effects and uh, malabsorption was there which was i mean the malabsorption was the reason for doing it but it was you know criminal and actually in the nafeld uh, in the nafeld uh, sort of perspective it actually worsened the liver and you could even get liver failure uh, by because of the various malabsorption uh, factors in this what became one of the most popular is the roux gastric bypass where you actually remove uh, you know you uh, you cut off most of the stomach which is producing the ghrelin the, you know the appetite uh, Uh, stimulating uh, uh, hormone which is coming from the uh, you know the most of the greater curve part and the fundus part so that is isolated and a small pouch is left so it's a many of these like i said are combinations of malabsorptive and uh, uh, restrictive procedures so you can see the restriction there you're making a small pouch uh, uh, so I, i just wanted to be familiar with the types and patterns you don't really need to worry about what is what but this is one of the most popular one of the two most popular Uh, this has been superseded by an even simpler technique, which I'll just come to. These two are more complicated ones for very obese patients. I just want you to familiarize yourself with the term where you're basically doing, uh, you know, you're inducing much more of malabsorption for very fat patients. So uh, it's rare, uh, currently not that frequently done, but you have certain indications when uh, needed. Uh, these are the more uh, common ones so the simplest was the adjustable lap laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding and i put it uh, because many of my medical gastroenterology colleagues might uh, you know uh, uh, understand why uh, the endoscopic techniques might also be useful using the balloons inside the stomach to restrict the capacity or using some form of plication endoscopic plication or you know uh, maybe in the future uh, ablate some of the mucosa there uh, the currently the most popular you know honeymoon period is with the sleeve gastrectomy because of the elegant simplicity originally it was uh, brought in to uh, as a as a step wise procedure for the bigger you know those bilio pancreatic diversions but uh, now it they show that it had such salutary effects on uh, 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 the weight itself and even more the you know diabetes control that it's now become the most popular uh, and you just basically whittling away part of the stomach leaving a a conduit having the stomach being used only as a conduit so uh, it's basically a restrictive procedure uh, another one which is not yet been approved in some countries but also elegantly simple is a miniature version of the gastric bypass where you have a single anastomosis it's also called the single anastomotic bypass so you have limited malabsorption basically the bilio pancreatic part uh, is responsible for you know uh, how much you divert is Uh, uh more uh, profound the weight loss because of the potential for the uh, you know uh, reflux of bile from here uh it's not yet been approved but i guess it's still in the part of the armamentarium now irrespective of what technique you use you have a profound and sustained weight loss uh, 
uh, uh, which is one of the goals only, but more importantly, uh, it reduces mortality. And I mean, you can do this with uh, with uh, with uh, acceptable mortality and morbidity, despite so many resections, divisions, anastomosis, high risk patients with multiple comorbidities, the morbidities uh, and mortality is fairly low. Uh, so all these obstructive sleep apnea, the respiratory, the degenerative uh, joint disease, uh, the uh, genital urinary functions, they can all improve with these surgeries. And uh, most importantly, and you know, uh, recognized now much more frequently, is the effect on uh, metabolic syndrome, which is salutary. You can actually cure diabetes. So you know, we we don't have the final word on NAFLD, but at least in diabetes, uh, nobody could believe that it is actually a surgical disease, not a medical disease. So uh, it has the potential to cure in appropriately selected patients, uh, 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 most of whom tend to be obese, but there could be some who are not obese as well. Hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and uh, it depends, of course, on, on preserved islet cell function. But it definitely reduces insulin resistance, and patients can become euglycemics in days to weeks. Uh, the mechanism of weight loss could be a variety of reasons, but there is uh, definitely, it's not only the weight loss. There is some uh, effect of the gut hormones as well, uh, uh, you know, so uh, the, uh, apart from weight loss, the reduced calorie intake, uh, there's also a gut hormone uh, role. Uh, so results, whatever the mechanism, the results are stunning. Uh, as I said, they uh, cure these two diseases. Uh, all these other diseases also can improve. There's a mortality risk has improved and there's a reduced risk of malignancies. So in the NAFLD uh, paradigm, it could also include HCC, if it can potentially reduce the incidence of cirrhosis uh, before it actually happens. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's a provocative but very reasonable hypothesis that uh, a surgery can actually produce full and durable remission of one of the most chronic diseases that, uh, you know, which, which is, I think, uh, uh, one of the, we are, we are uh, supposed to be reach the diabetes capital of the world fairly soon. Uh, and all this can be achieved at an operative risk, which is uh, only marginally more than that for a gallbladder removal. So, I mean, um, uh, I won't take you through these, but basically several studies showing uh, just finding, I told you, was the simplest procedure. So from that onto, you know, uh, high quality articles showing that uh, uh, definite improvement in all these uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis confirming the same uh, and that it is sustained. Uh, coming to NAFLD and NASH, since that is the focus today, uh, of course, uh, there's a, a definite uh, rationale for this. Uh, 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 Professor Sarin alluded to the, you know, the, the dyslipidemia associated uh, um, uh, disease. So it can uh, alter that, uh, which can result in natural remission. It improves the glycemic control with better insulin sensitivity, both peripheral and hepatic. Uh, it increased uh, insulin secretion also has been noted. Uh, and the sort of redu reduction of the inflammatory cytokines can also uh, probably cause a NAFLD remission. So uh, a variety of studies which are showing, quite a few of them are showing actually uh, improved. So, you know, uh, I, I notice a lot of people say that there are mixed results, but uh, if you see uh, several uh, studies which are actually looking at prospective histological uh, assessments of Dr. Duseja had shown us only the pre-picture, but I think we need to look at the post-picture of all the studies he showed were in patients undergoing uh, metabolic surgery. So uh, after that, uh, uh, I'm not sure he mentioned that, you know, there is actual improvement as well. Uh, so uh, so uh, there is uh, some uh, patients who, who show worsening, especially in the jejuno ileal bypass era. So that uh, image has lingered. Uh, but I mean, until we have you know, proper randomized trials showing these benefits, which are desperately needed. And that's why I thought it's important to show the, uh, the role of all these uh, so that all of you are able to take up these studies uh, since we are going to have some of the largest number of patients uh, uh, with us. And uh, so metabolic surgery in NAFLD is done for NASH or advanced fibrosis, but uh, they must be uh, pre-serotic. So if at least six months of medical and other lifestyle management does not improve uh, the condition. Uh, this probably many, many people in the West would uh, consider metabolic surgery. We tend to be a little more circumspect in India, but I think that needs to improve. It definitely improves the metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes, which is a secondary cofactor for the NAFLD. Uh, also the salutary effects on G, you know, uh, GLP-1, other gut hormones, and the lipid metabolic effects and the inflammatory uh, changes, which are responsible for the pathophysiology. So there's a sound uh, uh, 
physiological basis for it. So, and several cohort studies have shown improvement, but since some have shown worsening, so it's important that we are able to sift out uh, which are the ones we really need to concentrate on and how to select the patients more appropriately. Uh, so exhort you all to you know, uh, be part of these trials. Um, uh, apart from NAFLD and uh, you know, uh, metabolic syndrome and diabetes, it also decreases pregnancy-related complications. It improves overall quality of life in a variety of studies. Um, so clearly, bariatric cell, you know, to uh, sum up, conclude, it saves lives. It decreases cardiovascular, diabetic, cancer deaths, marked improvement in all obesity-related uh, comorbidities, um, diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea, uh, hyperventilation, uh, reflux disease, NASH, instasis, pseudotumor, uh, osteoarthrosis, urinary incontinence, PCOS, uh, and definitely improves the quality of life. Uh, uh, of course, I, it would be incomplete if I don't mention liver transplantation, but of course, it's too huge a field to cover in this. But that's also a pers you know, the surgeon's perspective in end stage uh, uh, NAFLD when it's already converted to cirrhosis. And we have one of the uh, uh, complications of very high MELD, which can actually, uh, you know, result in a, uh, a faster death of these patients. So there is a role there as well. Uh, so I think I'd just like to uh, say that since it's a multi-disciplinary uh, meeting, uh, Ajit, uh, who's also here on the panel, has exhorted that uh, we, you know, that 2013 to 20 actually uh, missed out uh, NAFLD as an important uh, factor. So I think we should look at the whole picture as one of the most important uh, components of NCD control. Uh, and the WHO does need to, so I think the uh, clarion call is extremely relevant because uh, 13 to 20 is over. Now 21 has started. Once we are start to live with uh, uh, COVID, we need to see how we can live without NAFLD and uh, NASH and other forms of uh, obesity. I thank you for a patient listening.